You know what coaches are famous for? All right, let's do this, and let's do it right. So now we do it right. All right, let's do it again. All right, we do it again, and we do it exactly right. All right, let's do it again, and we do it exactly right. All right, let's do it again, and we do it exactly right. All right, let's go again. We screwed up. I knew you guys couldn't do it. Start over. <laughs> Seriously? So there's this, there's this almost like, you know, sometimes, you know, I'll grab one of my good shooters, you know, right in the middle of doing something, I'll just go, over here. And they'll come over. All right, make a three right now. The kid probably hasn't touched the ball. We've been on defense for half an hour. Make a three right now. This is for a sprint, guys. And they're like, what, 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 what? I go, yeah, you know, we need a three, like right now. Make it. And the ones that are tough, they knock it down. The other one, they brick it. And I go, see, that's why she shoots threes and you don't. <laughs> that's not fair, but. <laughs> so, I, I, do you listen to what you're saying? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I amaze myself. <laughs> I couldn't play for me. Seriously. And, and is that maybe what allows you to understand what they're going through? Absolutely. So it's a direct line of empathy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I feel sorry for my players. I, I do, because the stuff I put them through, it's not fair. Um, I don't mean it's harsh. Don't get me wrong. It's just not fair, because I keep changing the rules. So just as they're getting close to getting what they want, I change the rule. So they always come up short. And the ones that keep fighting you. So here, here's the thing. Tell me if this is good or bad. I think, it's, I think it's bad, but I do it anyway. I think. I don't know. Tell me, tell me if you think this is true. How hard would you fight knowing you can't win? Unless, like on, the, on a scale of 1 to 1,000, there's 999% chance you will fail. There's one chance that you will win. How hard would you fight? Or do you know that after about five minutes and just say, hell with it, I can't win? So to me, I put them in situations where they cannot win. Unless, by the stroke of God, they get it right, exactly right, and then they win. Where does that come from? I have no idea. What, I, I, just think, I just think that when we play, like the game is, or, or anything else, is meant to be played a certain way, right? Like th this, this idea that girls should play different than guys. Like you would never expect that from a guy. You would never tolerate that in a guy. So why are you tolerating it in girls' basketball? That would be like taking your son and your daughter to the best swimming coach in America. And you say, oh, they want to make the Olympic team. And that coach picks up your son and throws him in the deep end and goes, swim, or you're going to drown. And then grabs your daughter by the hand and goes, come on, sweetheart. We're going to come down to this end of the pool. <laughs> Fire that guy. Take him someplace else. Whatever you expect from that guy, that's what you should expect from that girl. And that's how we do it. And that's not going to change as long as I'm the coach there. And I think too many coaches coach girls like they're girls. So they end up playing like girls. I know. Can't be politically correct in this business. Uh -huh. Got to tell the goddamn truth. <laughs> General thoughts? Well, you know, I love uh, Gino. He's immensely entertaining. Um, and he's just brutally honest in a way that I think is refreshing. Um, and I know it gets him into trouble, just like uh, uh, some of the stuff I say gets me into trouble. So we're a, a member of a generation that's slowly becoming extinct. But I'm glad uh, someone is still alive that, uh, you know, <laughs> tries to stuff his foot into his mouth as often as I try to. So uh, thank God you're still with us, Gino. So thank you. Yeah. And what's the biggest takeaway? Well, honestly, I was sharing this with him. Uh, I loved uh, that camera crew that followed him around uh, a couple seasons ago. The thing that I'm curious about that I would love to see is how every part of his practice is structured 
So he trains his kids to be extraordinarily competitive. And I think that's what sets him apart. This is what I anticipate sets him apart from all of us. And Anson, you've had a very similar upbringing to Gino. Gino, if you had one question for Anson, what would you want to ask him? Um, well, if he and I could do the, the next seminar and you could just sit out there and just a two I, I can go out there, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let him do, say exactly what he just said. Just keep saying that about me the whole time. <laughs> um, I, I think that, the, you know, when, when you coach college um, and you're coaching college women, even though it's a different sport, I think, uh, you know, when people mention Nance and Dorrance, you know, they, they, right away you think they never lose. They never lose for as long as I can remember. They never lose. And they're always in the Final Four. And they're always playing for a national championship. And it happens year after year after year after year. And the, the thing that intrigues me is you know at some point it has to end, that you can't do that forever. And you mentioned inside there that you finally had a class graduate without winning a national championship. You think about that. Finally, a particular group of kids spent four years in Chapel Hill and didn't win a national championship. That happens at every school in America. Did you know when those kids came in that they didn't have what it takes to win a national championship? Yes. Because coaches always know. Yep, uh, I know. I knew it was going to be uh, it was going to be uphill, uh, and actually they almost did it. We had a team in uh, 2016 that absolutely sucked, <laughs> and we ended up in the final four. And I'm looking around thinking, you know what? We just might win this thing, and then of course we didn't. Uh, so that was that. Um, but it was interesting, uh, you were talking earlier about uh, the abuse that the press gives you when you've lost three games in four years. What shocked me was the reaction when this graduating class didn't win a championship. Because now they're, the press is up and they're saying, you know, well, uh, Anson, you know, what does that feel like uh, you know, for you uh, to have a class graduating uh, that didn't win a national championship. I say, I feel extraordinary. And the press was saying, well, how is this possible? I said, because I don't think there's any coach in America that's been coaching as long as I have that wouldn't love to have an interview late in his coaching career with the first class that didn't win a national championship. And so it's really interesting the way the press will try to set the story before they've even asked you the question, because I knew how they were setting the story. Uh, and then I wanted to talk about the overachievement of this class, because if you had seen us in August, we were absolutely abominable. And then all of a sudden we end up in the Final Four. I was incredibly proud of that group, and I didn't want them to graduate thinking they didn't uh, uh, do anything except win uh, the championship they should have won. They did. They won all kinds of things they shouldn't have won. And I wanted them to graduate feeling really good about themselves, and of course the press wouldn't let them do that. It's, it's amazing that you've been able to keep the optimism as you've done that. Uh, if you were going to ask Gino a question, what would you have for him? Well, what I'm incredibly curious about is, and he was sharing this, so obviously I know some of the story, uh, is, is the stuff I said earlier, what you feel is the margin between what you're doing and all your competitors, because that's my suspicion. Do you create a competitive atmosphere in practice that none of your competitors are matching? I, I, <clears throat> I don't know because um, I don't have firsthand knowledge of what they're doing, what everyone is doing at practice. Because uh, we don't get to go see uh, other, other teams practice. But um, uh, my sense is that um, 
too many coaches, I think, are very fearful of pushing their best players, especially. That you get somebody really, really good, comes into your program, and then you're afraid of them. You're afraid to really coach them because they might leave. They might not be happy. They uh, might disrupt what you're doing. So you end up not coaching your best player. And then because you're not coaching your best player, the other players on the team aren't really going to um, accept that you're going to try to coach them because you have two sets of rules, one for your best player and one for your other players. Uh, and I see that happening a lot at a, at a lot of places. And uh, I've, I've never been afraid to coach my best player. And if they want to leave, then leave. And if a kid wants to quit, I'd rather they quit in November than in March. So I'm going to find out um, exactly what, what this kid's made of. And I've had kids come to me and say, um, Coach, I want, to, I want to win a national championship. I want to be an All-American. I want to play on the Olympic team. Well, that used to be in, in college, uh, women's basketball especially, the three things that you had as your goals. Now, you know, everybody wants to play in the WNBA or play overseas, whatever they want to do. So I have one kid, especially in her sophomore year, I called her in the office and I said, remember what you told me? And she said, yeah. So it's not going to happen. I said, it's not going to happen. Watching you for two years here, it's not going to happen. So here's your choices. Change your goals or change your work habits. One of those two things. If you want to keep your goals, then you need to change. So what's it going to be?